The views expressed on this Turnbuckle Tabloid live stream or Turnbuckle Tabloid podcast episode do not reflect the views, thoughts, or opinions of the RageWorks brand, including the RageWorks podcast network, RageWorks content partners, advertisers, and affiliates. Viewer and listener discretion is advised. kind of stereotype thing but i'm gonna yeah. say that you're a white guy right <laughs> no <laughs> no uh My a very large black individual very yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now calvin i gotta tell you uh i we, we watched a couple of stuff from you and i gotta say for a man of your style for your size and style you're you're pretty agile man yeah, yeah, yeah. it's something i've uh i've always like just growing up, I was never, like, the kind that, like, just because I was chunky, I wasn't going to try the same stuff my friends were doing. So, like, I, n- I never let that, like, limit me, whether like whether it be sports, wrestling, or, like, just whatever I want to do. Like, even as a kid, you know what I mean? When you eight, nine years old, jumping off of stuff with your friends, like, doing stuff that you probably shouldn't be doing, but my friends were doing it, I was trying it, too, no matter how much bigger I was than them, you know what I mean? Were you walking up like, I could jump off that... I could jump off the bunk beds, too. Yo, I can't tell you how many beds and stuff I broke with my cousins doing flips <laughs> off those things. Let me, let me tell you, yo, that, that, and I've never, I never had really the ambition to be a wrestler. I was more of a referee, manager kind of guy. Yeah, uh, manager's kind of the vibe for me. Yeah, as well. I was always getting that, for that but, but, you know, we always, we always took those little bumps from the mattresses or, or the, you know, little cardboard that he laid out. And yeah, we we we, oh, yeah. we we broke we broke a bed spring or two. We were, uh, the box springs and stuff were not uh, safe in my household. What uh, what got you into oh, wrestling? Never. What got you into the wrestling? Who introduced you to wrestling? I always want to always like knowing that. Was it a family member? Was it you randomly changing the channel? Uh, it was my older cousin Travis. He was like, I want to say he was like nineteen or twenty, and I was like three or four. But he used to come over and like babysit me. Or like I was like one of his like favorite little cousins, so he would just and my parents were like his uh, people that he'd go to to just like ask questions and stuff. So it was almost like he kind of took me under his wing when I was little. And so he turned on Nitro, and it was history. Like I saw Goldberg, I saw Rey Mysterio, and two people that like that I first remember being like huge fans of. They just like both in different ways did things that like I didn't think possible and blew my mind in different ways. Like so. Uh, yeah, I saw those, and I was like, instantly, I was like, I want to be like both of them. Wow, you actually did the opposite. Usually you hear guys talk about, you know, WWE, Bret Hart, or uh, The Rock, Stone Cold. You went the WCW way. Which is rare on the show. I don't think we've heard a talent on the show I don't say know, that. Because you're from Indiana, right? Yeah. Yeah, so maybe WCW had a better reach. Plus, that Midwest kind of area was very um, WCW, NWA kind of, uh, uh, of that. That was their territory. You know, the... The the, uh, the the up north, the Big East wasn't really f- wasn't looked upon well during that time. Yeah. See, uh, I don't even know if it was just that or if you watched all of it, but I just vividly remember WCW, and I found out about WWF like later on because like uh, one of my earliest childhood friends, he was a huge wrestling fan, so he turned me on to WWF when I was like five or six, and then like from then on, I was like watching every bit of wrestling I could. So when when the opportunity came to uh I guess get into the 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 wrestling field, 
Was this something that you said? I, I'm going to just go full body, full force, and just fuck it, just throw everything to the wind and just go in. Or were you hesitant in, in like, a lot of the guys who were like, ah, maybe wrestling, yeah, maybe, not- maybe, maybe wrestling might not be for me. Maybe, maybe there's certain efforts I should take my time with. Uh, yeah, there's that hesitancy because, like, I mean, growing up, like, so as I got older and, like, the prospect of, like, playing college football and finding out I was pretty good at that, like, I kind of, like, went away from wrestling because I had more, like, practices and stuff. I was just more busy, so I wasn't home all the time. You know how it is when you get older and you get in high school, you start going out hanging out with your friends and everything else. You're not home necessarily to watch TV at, like, a certain time, so I'd, like, come home and like check it out but I wasn't like I didn't talk about it with my friends I didn't have any friends or wrestling fans at that point they'd either grown out of it or just didn't you know what I mean didn't like it right so uh once everything with football ended uh I kind of like started to like pay attention to wrestling but really before then about my like junior year I saw Ring of Honor on TV uh and that was the first time I'd seen like the Kings of Wrestling that was the first time I'd seen like Dark City Fight Club, the Briscoes, like, all those guys that were there, like, 2010, like, uh, I, the exact episode that I, that I tuned in on was the episode after Kevin Steen turned on El Generico, and I saw, like, the chair beating he gave him and, like, the emotion that was there, and I was instantly sold, because that's how they, like, pretty sure that's how they started the TV, the, the, uh, the episode was showing what had happened at the pay-per-view the week, or the weekend before, or mm-hmm. however long before that was, and so, like, that really got me, kind of got me thinking about it. And then, uh, like, once everything, a couple years later with football happened and I already had my daughter and uh, I really started getting into wrestling more and really started to, like, really pay attention to indie wrestling and uh, realized that it was, like, something that was attainable, like, in the area, like, within a couple hours. You know what I mean? So you're lucky you were able to get, like, you get the Ring of Honors because up here in in New York, it's it's you you don't get the Sinclair Network or any of that, so you you literally have to like pay for the shit to fuck it, to to watch it. You would think see hey, we can get uh, it. It was like a part of an exclusive get it here club. anymore. It was when they were on uh, HDNet. Right, right. There was HDNet for right, Access right, right. TV now. Yeah, so like yeah. I happen to have that channel. Right, right. So that's the only reason I got it then. But then they they changed the channel, so I don't even get it now. Damn you, Time Warner and your bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> But you say you know you, you talk about football. Let me let me see. Were you were you, you played the blind side? Or were, were we protecting the QB on the blind side? Uh, uh I mean, from time I, I played a little bit more guard because I'm not like six six. Right. Uh, and I was pretty agile for pulls and things of that nature. But uh, really, my bread and butter was defense. I played like everywhere on the defensive line and uh, little like uh, played a little linebacker in my younger days, but. I was more of a defensive tackle, defensive end. Oh, we was getting in the trenches. We was out there. We was uh, gouging eyeballs and yes, shit. Sir. All right. Yes, shit. sir. Got to respect the man who could turn that corner, especially, like I said, you're an agile man. You, that footwork had to be crazy. Yeah. Like, I don't, I'm not talking about – I don't have that uh, top speed, that, like, breakaway speed. Right. But within that 10, 20 yards, I, I got speed that way. Like, I, I got that like, acceleration and the a short distance speed. But I don't have, like, the 40-yard top, top speed. Yeah, he's like, listen, if, if you if you get around me around the corner, oh, believe me, I'll chase you down to the sideline. I'll get you there. But I ain't running no Hail Mary. Yeah. <laughs> I'll get no, you there. No, no. I ain't running no Hail Mary. You put me out there with a receiver, I'm Dustin. <laughs> <laughs> now, did you play any college ball? Uh, no, I had some I had some looks from, like, in uh, IU, Indiana State, um, some other uh, D1 schools. I had a couple, like, a, a little bit of interest in the zoo and then some smaller schools. But uh, I didn't have the grades. Uh, coming out of high school, mm-hmm. uh, went to a junior college. There's no junior colleges in the state of Indiana that offer a football program. Right. Closest ones are in Missouri, and I couldn't afford out of state uh, tuition. So, went to a junior college here to get my grades up, hopefully to transfer to IU, and then uh, found out I was going to be a dad halfway through the first semester and dropped out and got a job. Oh, let me find out. We already know those athletes, they get the vagine. I see you. Start off young. I see you. Oh, man, after my own heart. Jeez. But, you know, it, it's a good thing. But, you know, even you tell a story, you you, 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 you became a young father, um, still had an ambitions to do something else, something bigger. Uh, and yet you, you still had that 
pull the gravitation to to get into wrestling. What was the first wrestling school you went to? Uh, WCWO training school is a small place in Indiana that's been around since the early 90s, uh, late 80s, early 90s, I believe. Uh, so they've been around forever. So, I mean, most of the people that come from the Indiana scene or the area have at least stepped through the doors of WCWO at one point or the other, mm -hmm. uh, whether it be like that's the first place that gave them ring time to like own their craft or, you know what I mean? So, um, that's where I got my start, uh, under, I mean, throughout my time there, my training there, I probably had 10 different people that had something to do with my training for at least a couple weeks at a time. You know what I mean? Cause it was one of those things where like, uh, it was more of like, uh, yeah, like, like a revolving door of trainers that, and shit. Yeah, basically, like they were all they were all friends and they were all invested and uh, they all cared about the Central Indiana scene. So they would come in like, if my trainer had like a show or something, or there was something that he couldn't make it, someone with his family, then he's calling one of the other vets to come in and help me out. You know what I mean? Uh, from like uh, Congo Kong was one of them to uh, a guy named uh, Hillbilly Jed was the guy that was there for my first bump. Uh, mm. I don't know how much you pay attention to the Indiana scene, but. Uh, if you've paid attention, like Bizarro Lucha um, on IWTV, yeah. uh, Sean Kemp, his dad, TJ Kemp, uh, was another one. He's in, He was trained at OVW in the early 2000s. So oh, okay. He really, like, took me from, like, just knowing how to bump and do a few things to, like, actually teaching the, the psychology and the old school aspect of it so that I had a basis to, like, build from there you know what i mean make sure i have that strong foundation yeah it's uh, it's, so, tough, like, it's tough when you hear stories like wow these guys are, are training now because you know everybody seems to think just because they watch it on youtube or they watch it on tv everything's that simple you know i, I like to hear stories where you get a gentleman like yourself who's gotten the old school kind of training whereas you work you work take them early bunks was it like was it just straight up we're gonna be working wrist locks and lot and holds for the for these next couple of weeks <laughs> We learned to bump and run the ropes, and then uh, to give us a break to cool down, he would teach us the six leg rest holds of doom that we did. I don't know how many. That's what we called it. Right. We called the six the six rest holds of doom because he was always teaching them to us, and we all knew them, but we always had to like you know what I mean. Uh, we either had to help other people out, but it was just something like little things that he would like stress. You know what I mean even as much as, like, whipping somebody out of the corner or, you know what I mean, just, just little stuff like that. The little things that add up in a match that you don't think adds up that that can get glossed over easy were really, like, hammered home. You know what I mean? Yes. Uh, speaking of, like, uh, the, the small things, because, uh, you know, over here we we truly believe when, when, you, when you do those minor details in a match, it, it, it turns into a, a th from a three-star to a five. Uh, what are your thoughts on – on the debate of the wrestling world of 2020, which is, uh, is there an, is there being becoming an overusage of these high flying moves, and and are they are, is the wrestling world starting to fade away from the old school techniques uh, of, of yesterday? Like, what are your thoughts on that? Um, not necessarily, no, because if it's done right, if it's done correctly, like, um, now while the moves may be a little bit different, there's there's a way to make everything make sense and to tell that story. So it's all about uh, if if you can do that. You know what I mean? That's the difference between, like, uh, who just – one of the best high flyers right now is Will Ospreay, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so he – the difference between, like, in my opinion, when you first saw him, when he first came on the scene and he was super skinny, is he did a lot of flips and he was athletic, and that's what got you. But if you watch him now, he can have a 35-minute match make everything make sense and tell a story that pulls you in while doing all that stuff. You get what I'm saying? So like, and that's all based off of like, it's all based off of the, the same psychology and the same things that were taught from yesteryear. It's just figuring out your flavor and what you do and how to make it different and make it work within the realm of professional wrestling. So if it's done right, there's, there's no, there's no, like, I don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with it, especially because, like, if you have a guy my size, like, you look at me, right? If I'm, if I'm wrestling a guy that's half my size, I mean, 
he's going to need the momentum of flying off the top rope to take me down and cause a lot of a lot of damage. Cause, yeah, but the problem I mean, the problem would be that the wrestling. problem would be that I don't want to see you doing it because it doesn't it, to me it seems like that shouldn't be in your wheelhouse. Yeah, but then like you got to think of it this way, right? Uh, it it's a risk, yes, but that's like saying that's like old school basketball saying that you got to be Hakeem and you can't be Giannis and be seven foot be able to dribble and shoot you see what I'm saying like if you if you watch the UFC right mm-hmm. uh, the big guys are still throwing the head kicks and doing the same techniques as the little guys do don't they right but it, you know, and, you know and, what I mean? and, and, if it's effective there's a time and place for everything exactly right. so it's like one of those things it's like uh it's it's like it's a uh, risk risk reward type of thing. Like if you if you can make that make sense, or you can do it. Like I'm not gonna do like 18 flips because if I do one flip and I hit it, nobody's kicking out of it. You get what I'm saying? Like, make, like, like in terms of making it special, uh, that, that's I think that's what. Um, well, not yeah. even that. But if a 350 pound man does a running shooting star on you, he's like. That's a lot different than a 175 pound man doing that. You get what I'm saying? Like there's a, there's a difference there. It's funny because and when you got to make that make sense. When I, when when I, I see when I seen you wrestle, um, automatically I get the, like this this look of Keith Lee or Willie Mack, and you know not because you're black, not the stereotype. No, I, I get you. I won't go there. But but who I would say what you you remind me of, which is a, a really throwback look, is Bam Bam Bigelow. Oh yeah, that's definitely. A, that's a big. That's a. I, I was like, wow, it's like it, you're you're a new age, new school kind of kind of guy, but you also have that classic feel of a band man. Do you do you study the old or even the newer, bigger guys who are who are, who are uh, in the ring and who are, who are who's been your influences? Uh, I've talked about this in a lot of interviews. My influences. Oh, you did that. You ain't uh, gotta talk about. Well, what I, what I want to do. No, you ain't gotta talk about. It. <laughs> no, forget. My career is kind of like. <laughs> Oh, sorry. I was going to say that, that <laughs> no, I'm kidding, yeah. uh, Bam Bam and Vader. Oh, really? Like, it's one of those things where I want to take – because that's what I'm saying is, like, the difference between them is they were big, but they were athletic, and they still just showed that athleticism, but it didn't take away from their size, and you knew that if they hit you, they were going to knock your teeth down your throat. Right. So I want to take that, but take that to the next level. Like, I want to show – like, they did athletic stuff, uh, they, and they did a lot of athletic stuff, but like, I want to take that to a new level. I want to do that cleaner. I want to do things that uh, they didn't even think that they that somebody their size would be able to do. Like, you know what I mean? Like, that, like, I don't know. That's just what I feel like. Uh, but they're so used to seeing a certain type of heavyweight. Like when I was a kid, I was a big kid, but I didn't. I never wanted to wrestle like a heavyweight. I hate. I don't like guys that just stand in the middle of the ring and swing their arms and don't do anything. Like, you are an athlete. You are a professional wrestler. Like, you know what I mean? You watch dudes in the NFL, and those 6'5", 300-pound men are some of the most athletic people on the field and some of the smartest. So it's right. like one of those things where uh, just because you're big doesn't mean you can't be athletic or you can't do those things. So it's like I want to be different. I want somebody to see me, <clears throat> and I want to have the same impact that those guys had, not only on the business as a whole but on uh, – uh, the next generation, you know what I mean. I think there's also things to where, uh, uh, for me, it's when you when you see a big man, you know, two eighty, two ninety, tipping three. I think I, I I don't know. Like I said, it's not sitting in the ring just waving your arms, flailing, or showing that you know the dominant person. But I also think that I uh, with a lot of guys who are that size, they feel it's the need that they have to be going from zero to one hundred at any moment. That it has to be that way. Where you know, when you hear conversations at Big Show or Kane or Undertaker I talked about where they said, you know, the main importance is pacing when you're that size. Uh, yeah. Of course, like you said, yeah, of course, you're going to you, you can pull out like a Bam Bam and Vader out their moves and stuff. But what gets lost is the pacing. Um, what was the biggest thing in training? Because you didn't just blow up to be what it was. Like you said, you've always been, you know, a big boy. Like, but what was what was like the key things that you learned in training that helped you in your matches? That was one of the things is uh, pacing. Uh, that's the thing that's helped me a lot is I've learned to balance, like, 
the athleticism, using the size, and my pacing. Um, I, I have a good gas tank for a guy my size from doing athletic stuff and having to have that gas tank my whole life. But uh, pacing is not only important in the cardio aspect, but it's also important in letting the fans digest what you're doing. Right. So uh, we don't get a reaction if we speed through everything and they don't get a chance to really take in what we're doing. So that was one of the things that was really hammered into me when I first started. Is even after I, after I was having matches, I'd have match matches with TJ Camp, and I'd be like, or he'd watch my match, and I would be like, call him pops all the time because he was like, like my wrestling dad. You know what I mean? Takes right. me on fishing trips, everything else. So it's like, uh, was I slow enough? Hey pops, was it slow enough? Was it, was was my pace there better? No, it's slower. Like it was one of those things where it's like, you almost feel like. Uh, like one of them like Karate Kid movies where he's telling you something and you're like, are you sure? Because I felt like I was doing this right. Like, right. I don't know if he's really like, and then when I finally like got it and I felt it, it was like, okay, I get what he's saying now. I get what he means. You know what I mean? How long was it before you got so, your first booking out the, um, out of the, uh, out of training? Like what was it? Uh, how long was it if you got your first, uh, the first match? Legit, legit match. Even if it was for a hot dog and a steak uh, kind of match. Uh, I had my first, now, they put me in matches, but they were, like, limited. So, like, that's, that, that was the thing. So, like, uh, battle my first match, were you in those battle I did it, like, the scrambles, battle, huh? the scrambles, the battle royals. No, no, well, <laughs> yeah, some stuff like that. Like, my first match, I had that four weeks into training, and it was just a battle royal. So, I wasn't doing anything but cakes, cakes and punches. You know what I mean? Like, little stuff, but just to get me used to a crowd. And to, like, actually get me used to being in the ring with, you know what I mean? Right. Vets and doing all that other stuff. And then three or four weeks later, they had me in like an elimination four-way. I did a few things before I was out of it. So like it was just a little like, let's see how he does. And then it was like three months of nothing. And then, you know what I mean? Uh, and then when I first started working, the only place I was working was the free show on Fridays. So I wasn't like, you know what I mean? It was like, it was a controlled thing. Like, there's a lot of people that will train for a year and a half without, like, doing it. And uh, they were kind of like, because they ha they ran their own show weekly, you know what I mean? It was one of those things where uh, they would use that to help, like, it's easier to do, to, uh, it's, like, you can learn a lot from uh, doing it, you know what I mean? From, like, actually doing it in a crowd setting. Like, you can do a lot of stuff in the ring, but, like, there's a lot of, like, listening and understanding of things that, like, happen in the match that's easier to explain or experience in a match, you know? Was it, was it, uh, I mean, was it, were you humble about it, or were you, were you that kind of guy that was like, uh, let me, let me lose, I'm ready to get into these, to these singles matches, curtain jerkers, let me get to the, you know, the, the, the before intermission, you know, get me in there, like, were, or were you understanding, like, yeah, I got to go through the paces before anything happens? Yeah, I was understanding because I came from football. Like, it's one of those things. It's just like you could be in practice. You could you you could have been the best player in a game, but if you don't put that effort in, in practice, coach isn't going to start you. So, like, you got to put that work in to show that you're worth that to, to get that. You know what I mean? So uh, I was never one that was like, oh, I'm better than him, or I feel like I should have this, like, if I, even at any point in my career, if I ever felt like, man, I wanted that spot, it was like, all right, well, then I got to work harder because I'm still there doing something I'm not. <clears throat> so let me go drop back to the drawing board and show that I earned it, all right, and prove that I'm worth that, you know? I can only imagine you going into these battle royals or these scrambles early on and the, 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 the crowd sitting there going, oh, he's going to win. He's definitely going to win. <laughs> and you get tossed out in the first minute. <laughs> well, no. See, I about a run, I get tossed out the first minute. minute. <laughs> but see, and I, one thing I remember on my first battle royal is they put me up against the ropes, and I was wearing a little cut off at the time because I didn't really have like oh, you must have looked actual fabulous with the cut off. Like, you must have looked awesome. Plus, uh, yeah. <laughs> so they put my shirt and put it over my head where I couldn't see. And then they oh, had two nah. guys holding my arms on the ropes, and they did, like, a line, and people took turns chopping me. Oh, great. Welcome to wrestling. Yeah, I, 
it's a, I, and I hope you got and gave everybody their receipt later on in their, in your career who started that off and did that. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Now now everybody gets everybody everybody gets the heaters. <laughs> everybody gets it. So um, you've been in the business right now. For, you you can say for how long? Uh, almost five years. It'll be five years in November. And you, you know you got this big opportunity with uh, MLW. Um, you're you're there with a friend of a show that 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 a friend of ours who who's who's done a show a couple of times, Carol Kwan, uh, he, who's been rehabbing uh, well. Can't wait to once this starts opening up. What what's what's the prospect for you? How are we gonna start tearing it up over there? Uh, uh, how's Court and I been reaching out? How they've been uh, keeping in contact with you? Uh, they've been really good. I mean, uh, everything's up in the air right now with Corona and everything, and uh, when we're gonna be able to like actually get back to live tapings. So I'm I'm really excited about that, but you know that's up in the air. So, but uh, other than that, I mean they've been really good. They uh, uh, all the talks we had, they seem like they really have my back and uh, they're really in my corner. So uh, it's just excited. I'm just really excited to finally have uh, the opportunity to show what I could do at the next level. Uh, but, I mean everybody's trying, but it's one of those things where like, uh, you know, you hear rumblings from this this place or this or that, and then I had the uh, tryout with WWE in December, so it's like one of those things where uh, a lot of people were like, eh, maybe, and then MLW said they actually, like, uh, that once they saw me, they actually were like, nah, like, we believe in you, we want to give you this opportunity because we think you're going to knock it out of the park, and so, like, just having that, uh, for me, uh, made, uh, it meant a lot to me, um, and then, uh, it's just one of those things where it's like, uh, I was been doing this for five years now. Mm. And so, uh, we, now that I'm with MLW, it's that next level, it's that next t- tier. So like, uh, it doesn't matter what I think I know now, now it's TV. So now I, I got to open my ears and shut my mouth and listen, uh, because there's a lot I'm going to have to listen and learn. Uh, and there's going to be that process, but I'm excited to grow and I'm excited to uh, show what I can do on a uh, national and worldwide level. Yeah, it's going to be fun like I, to see you out there, you know, I'm, playing to I, a I, camera to know where everything is at and all that. I'm excited to see the the possible matchups. Uh, you get to work with um, guys like Jacob Fatu and, and um, some other guys over there. Is there anyone in, in particular that you're excited to first time maybe work with? Or Please say Loki. Please say Loki. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. That, that's, that's up there. Uh, but, uh, I'm a, I'm gonna have to say my top three off the top of my head are probably Loki, Hammerstone, and Fatu's got to be number one, because, like, uh, right now, like, we're, we're two of the, the few guys that are up in the super heavyweight division that can do some of the things that we do, so, uh, it'd be nice to test myself against, uh, one of the best, and one of the best big men in the world, period, so. Uh, I can't lay claim to that until uh, I step in the ring with the best, so I'm excited. Well, before uh, before we we do see you in MLW, you have a big uh, a big show coming up on uh, August the 16th, right for VXS. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm really excited about that one. Is, uh, that, is it your first? Is your first match, match out of um out of out of this whole COVID thing? Like your first return back into the ring? No. Um, we did. I did the GCW show. Right. Uh, the 22nd. And then we, I have uh, this weekend. I have three shows actually. I have uh, uh, Paradigm Pros having uh, heavy hitters uh, and first round matchup UWF I rule me and Tom Lawler. Uh, and then um, going to Jersey on Saturday and Sunday for GCW's homecoming weekend. Yeah, right, you'll be for homecoming, right? Yeah. So I got this weekend coming up, and then uh, all sites on the 16th. All right. As a matter of fact, you'll be at homecoming with uh, uh one of our another friend of our show, Homicide's in the building that day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's facing Homicide at VXS. Oh, oh, look at that! Yeah. Look at that! Yeah. I, I don't know. Who, I don't know who to root like, for once now. I found yeah. out, yeah, once I found, well, once I found out who I was wrestling, uh, I definitely got excited because like we got a little, a little bit of history there. Uh, yeah, former tag team champions, right? But yeah, so it was one of those things where uh, Eddie got into some trouble and couldn't make it to the show. So uh, we did the whole thing. I ended up 
screwing with my tag partner at the time, and then uh, helped him retain the belt. Uh, I was excited to learn from him and Eddie because, you know, those are legends in the game. Yeah. Two people that, like, especially Homicide, because I was a huge TNA fan, but uh, both of them were two people that I admired and looked up to. And then, like, that match happened, and then he never came back to defend them. And so it was just me defending them in handicap matches. So now it's that time that I get to uh, step in the ring. And uh, it's not even about, like, tag titles and none of that other stuff. It's more about, like, proving that, like, hey, like, I wanted you in my corner to learn from you because uh, I thought, I like, you know what I mean? I was worth you investing your time in, so you should have been here to invest your time. So now here I am. Little boy that became the man, and we're gonna twig it out and see who comes out on top. Oh, fuck that, yo. You a big dude. You can handle that shit all by yourself, yo. You don't need me. Fuck that <laughs> shit. <laughs> um, my fucking guy, though. So, two things noted here. Um, you did a vignette actually for VXS with your uh, your boy Jay Rose. Uh, I mean, if you could talk to the to the listeners and tell them how the how how, how it was filming that, and also, uh, what what drew your eye to VXS? Uh, I know they're doing the whole re the the re the redo here. They're they're starting fresh. Uh, what what's the new look of VXS that's exciting you for the most? Uh, really talking to everybody over at VX or VXS. They have that uh. It's just a whole new vibe, like, definitely, like, one of the few promotions that definitely want to be in tune with the culture and what young people are into right now, and so they're going to give you uh, a different, a little different feel, a little different vibe than anybody else can bring to you, so I'm really excited to be a part of uh, the relaunch of the company. Yeah, and you fit the criteria perfectly, like, that. that's your, that's your lane right there. But I ask you when I ask you this, I'm, I'm thinking of this as a father as well because although I never took a bump, but it, it kind of looked like I could have because many people do look at me and be like, "Have you wrestled before?" Yeah, with my <laughs> ex-wife and her bullshit. Any case, that's another story I'm going to go into. But <laughs> does does your daughter <laughs> does your daughter look at daddy and like say like, "I know what daddy does, but I don't understand it." Uh, kind of. Like, she shows a little bit of interest, and she wrestles with me at the house. Right. But, like, she's not necessarily a wrestling fan. Right. I get her to watch it with me sometimes, but, like, she gets it. Like, she she understands that, like, you know, daddy's taking care of himself, and he'll be all right, and he's not going to, like, nobody's trying to kill him. But, uh, I don't know. She's still a little hesitant to actually get in the ring. I don't know why the ring scares her, but she'll chop the piss out of me at home. So. Yeah, but but when you wrestle her, do you put her over? That's the, oh, that's the ultimate no, question. never. Yeah, exactly. You're not no. supposed to put her over. That's no, no. Listen, no. Hey, I got to to put her over, man. Trophy around here. Exactly. Wow. No so, participation so, trophy. So you're not putting. Okay. I mean, no. 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 All right. I mean, she makes me put, like, belts I have at home. She wants me to put them on the line. I'm like, listen, I can't be doing that. I can't be dropping belts. <laughs> we, don't drop belt. we don't drop any belts here. This is how we do. <laughs> <laughs> so if you, had a, if you had a choice between being um, a world heavyweight champion in wrestling or a world heavyweight champion for the Nathan's Hot Dog Championship, which one would you take? Nah, we ain't eating grizzlies exactly. out here. Yeah. Hey, I don't like hot dogs that much. <laughs> Right, fine. How about yeah. buffalo wings? Like if I'm real hungry, I'll eat a hot dog or two. But to eat, them dudes eat like sixty hot dogs at once. No, <laughs> like they look that, many that looks would. painful. I'm not. <laughs> it looks like a scary movie when like you got some type of like monster in you. It's about to bust out your stomach. That's what it looks like when they get done. Because half the dudes are like skinny too. Like what was the uh, Kobashi dude? Yeah, 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 like you can see the like imprints of the hot dog on them. Would eat like sixty hot dogs, look nine months pregnant. It's crazy. And it's funny because like the people understand when they see big, big guys like us, they think like, wow, you know, you probably could put away from. See, we appreciate food. We take our time. We enjoy a nice T-bone or a ribeye. We don't just devour it. We we enjoy mm-hmm. we enjoy the majesty of it. <laughs> yeah. No. Uh. Man, yeah, and before we let you go, um, in Indiana, man, that's a that's a different scene, man. That's a different culture out there from what we got in New York. Uh, I mean, what, what what was the what was the music scene, the hip hop scene for you back in, in when you were coming up? What was that like out there? So, uh, 
the hip hop scene out here, man. I'm gonna tell you honestly, like other than like real local like mixtape people, like, you like you go to Circle to the Mall or anywhere in town and you see it do an annual mixtape. Half the time I wasn't listening to it. So until like uh, social media really started popping off, that's when kind of uh, you really start paying attention to like Indian artists. Uh, so like right after I got out of high school, you know, uh, I don't know if you ever heard of Mark Battles. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, he's from Indy. Right, um, right, right. Yeah, yeah, he is from Indy. Yeah. We got uh, another dude that's pretty good named Draco McCoy. He's from Indy. Um, we got we got some people out here. Uh, I got my my own dude, Kobe Selfmade. Uh, I grew up around him. Uh, so like, and me, uh, I dabble a little bit in making beats and stuff. So uh, I'm definitely consider myself a hip hop head. Oh, uh, what were you using to make beats? You can't mention Indiana without mentioning Freddie Gibbs also. Oh, uh, Freddie Gibbs, be up there, man. Gary, yeah. but Freddie Gibbs lyrically is just. Uh, on another level, yeah. his last uh, his Alfredo that, that makes say that album. Yeah, I can't stop playing that with my Alchemist. Boy, uh, uh, with his production on that, ridiculous. Yeah, my boy Josie's boy put me on to Freddie Gibbs, man. The, 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 the kid is a lyricist. He sounds like he's such he is such a mixture of generally like the New York and the Midwest kind of feel, man. He's a good dude. Yeah, Indiana's kind of crazy because we're kind of stuck in the middle of like. So you got like. Uh, Cleveland, Ohio, you got your Bone Thugs and Harmony I grew up listening to. Mm-hmm. Then you got your Chicago stuff, like your Twista and everybody else over there. So we get a little bit of that. And then we also get a little bit of that Memphis with some 3-6. So, like, there's all that stuff that, like, I grew up listening to all of that. You got that St. Louis, you got that Nelly vibe and all that, the lunatic. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. All that. Yeah, all you that. got all that. I thought he was going to sit there and bust out and be like, yeah, you know, I really, I don't really listen to that. I'm into Rascal Flats. <laughs> nah, I know Calvin's into um the Zach Brown band or the something like Brown that. The Zach Brown band. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm into all that. So, before we let you go, we're going to start, we're going to, uh, we, this is a little segment I just come off of the pop of the head that we did last last week. We're just going to kick it off with you. We're going to do a segment called um, Would You Rather. So, I'm going to just give you a quick, uh, quick scenario. So, it, it'll be, uh, just make a choice out of these two. Would you rather. All right, ready? Would you rather. All right. Would you rather do... The year of MLW or automatic three years at NXT? Ooh. You know what? Uh, I'm a firm believer in everything happens for a reason, so I'm going to say uh, I'd rather be an MLW because that's who wanted me. Oh, that's cool. That's a good way to look at it. The grind is real, man. Yeah, man. You got another one? Yeah, sure. Would you rather... Jordans or Nikes? Man. Adidas. No. <laughs> I'm going to have to go. Like, if I'm going to have to choose between Jordans and Nikes, I'm probably going to go Jordans. Just because I grew up a basketball head and, like, the era of, like, hip-hop that I grew up in was heavily influenced by Jordan. I mean, you had your, like, other Nike stuff, get your Air Force ones and all that other stuff. Yeah. But I was always more of a Jordan kid. Like I love me some sevens, some eights. Uh, you know what I mean? <clears throat> Once you get past the, like a thirteen, I'm I'm off of them. But you know what I mean? Yeah. Up until up until up until like twelves, uh, I'm cool with. Um, how about this one? Death match or cinematic match? Especially oh, after I'm watching what you. After what you just saw, <laughs> after the swamp, yeah, play, death match. Gonna... I'm, I'm, I'm not a huge cinematic guy. Uh, I mean, it's done right in certain spots, but like, I'm not a. I like, I don't know. I watched the match early, and I was kind of confused. That's just not my tip. But you, you're into death match wrestling. Uh, I will say, oh, I, I, I love to watch it. I just don't know if I could put my body to it to do it. But I mean, I've done a few, uh, but. Um, yeah, so, like, going along with, uh, I was talking about, uh, earlier that, uh, I don't know if I was here or not, but, uh, one of my heroes is Ruckus, uh, from the old Backyard Wrestling games, because the, the two people that I watched from those, uh, my two favorites, was Ruckus, because he was doing things I'd never seen done before, and, like, he, like, he looked like me, like, he wasn't super jacked, he was just, like, 
uh, a black dude that did some of the most ridiculous moves I'd ever seen. Like, you know what I mean? Right. Like, I could look at him, I could see myself in him. So I was like, yeah, like, I could do this. And the other one was Sick Nick Mondo, and I couldn't tell you why. Nick but, like, Mondo, wow, yeah, shit. Yeah, so, like, I watched the clips in, and those are the two guys that, like, when, like, YouTube and stuff was, like, really first becoming a thing, like, at least when I was first getting on it when I was a kid, those were the two people that I w- looked up, like, indie wrestling clips of. And one last one. Uh, sex with a white woman or sex with an Asian? Ooh, I've never been with an Asian. So. <laughs> but, like, but of thing. course you've been with a white here's woman. My <laughs> <laughs> here's, here's my thing. Though. Of course. I don't discriminate. I don't discriminate. discriminate. If you're attractive and I vibe with you, then... Uh, your race or your color or ethnicity and none of that stuff matters to me. So, I mean, if I think you're fine and Yeah, yeah, yeah. Enough, sex with a white woman or sex with an Asian? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's what I'm saying. I can't answer. He's saying he can't answer because he's been with a white woman, but he doesn't know He doesn't know because he hasn't been with an Asian, so he can't, he can't, he can't tell you. All right. All right, food without seasoning or Chinese food? Which one? <laughs> <laughs> Where we go to dinner? My world famous I'm potato just, salad I'm with no seasoning. Food. I'm, a, I'm a Chinese food. All right, potato so salad we with food. potato salad with grapes in it or MSG? What are we talking about here? Yo, what's your grapes? go-to Chinese no, order? That's negative. We ain't doing that. We ain't doing that. What's huh? your what's your go-to Chinese, Chinese order? Food? Man, uh, I'm kind of simple. You can give me like a, a chicken lo mein combo with some like fried rice, and then I get some pot stickers too. They gotta get some pasta. <laughs> I'm salivating. Okay. That sounds phenomenal. Okay. Yeah. Well, sounds, man, Calvin, uh, I'm more of a chicken wing fry guy, but. <laughs> but Calvin, thank you for your time, <laughs> Chinese man. Chinese restaurant? Yeah, of course. Well, you know, New York's Chinese restaurants is way different, man. We got like a. It's like a. You can get Chinese food and probably get a. I can get a Big Mac at, a, at the Chinese oh, spot in the oh, corner, bro. Puerto Rican Benny sandwich at the, right next to it. Like, it, we different up here. Bro. If one next time I come up to New York, I don't, actually I've never been to New York. I've been to New Jersey. I've never been to New York. I've seen New York. I ain't never been there. Well, next time you come so, up, you come over here. We'll get, you, we'll get there, you the best Chinese take food. Me to some spots and show me around. Oh, I to believe me, I have a line for you, bro. It'll be, it'll be, man. Please, listen. You, we'll, listen, we're coming for a part two, and we'll order some of the ch- uh, best oh, Chinese food around please. here. All right, there's a steak. There's a steak place that you will fucking. They will see you walking, and they'll start putting the cow in the, on the fucking. In the, in the smoker, they'll see you coming. <laughs> <laughs> but Calvin, as yo, thank you for calling in and uh, sharing time with us. And um, guys, you, you got you you gonna you're going to have to check out the excess and Calvin Tankman there. Uh, you could you could watch it on um uh, on fight on fight TV. They're gonna they're 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 airing their upcoming event on August 16th. You got the read over there, Amosi. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's called uh, No Justice, No Peace. Um, stars like Nolo Catano, Jonathan Gresham versus Tony Deppin, but we're here for the main for, for the man himself. We got Calvin Tankman versus Homicide. The yo, sto- I'm going to fuck you up, yo. I'm telling you, man. No, yo, there ain't no beef, though, but I'm going to fuck you up for <laughs> real, bro. <laughs> I didn't show for a reason, yo. And then after that, we go to the bar and have a shot of Henny, bro, because we peoples. We cool like that, yo, all right? <laughs> <laughs> Calvin, any, any upcoming work besides um, VXS that you want to promote? Um, and also, let everybody know they can get you on social media as well. Oh, yeah. Uh, I believe I said all my dates uh, yeah, you did, yeah. that I have for right now. But um, catch me on social media, uh, Twitter and Instagram, at Calvin Tankman, Facebook.com slash Calvin Tankman 1. Uh, yeah, so uh, ProWrestlingTees.com slash Calvin Tankman. Don't want to forget about that one, too. Yeah, and Calvin. Uh, um, always need some money if y'all want to give me some money for a cool yeah, shirt. Of yeah. course, it's sport the man, especially times like this. The indie scene was hurting for a while. Now it's making a bounce back. You know, they got to make some bread, yo. Uh, yeah, and uh, before we go, Calvin, I mean, I posted something on Twitter uh, on our page about like a month ago, um, shouting out a couple of the of the talent I think, I think could really bring the independent wrestling scene to a better light. You, the guys like uh, you, Tony Deppin, uh, the Jordan Olivers, the uh, the list goes on and on. Uh, Daniel Garcia. Um, I, I made that tweet because I, you know, in the past week, let's just be honest, the independent wrestling world hasn't had the best light on it. Um, in terms of mm-hmm. the whole speaking out and stuff, but guys like you, um, young, hungry, I, I, I'm t- you guys have the the craft to to make the independent scene the way it it should be. And I just want you to know that not only me, but um, so many people have faith in you guys, and you guys could take control and take the steering wheel. Everything's gonna be all right. 
Thank you, man. Thank you. That means a lot. It's uh, I don't know, man. With the uh, reception I've gotten recently, it was kind of like unexpected. It's one of those things where you always tell yourself, like, I know when I get that opportunity, I'm gonna knock it out of the park. But like, uh, when it actually things start happening, uh, uh, it's it's blown me away. So uh, thank you for that, man. It means a lot. Yeah, as a matter of fact, listen, uh, another guy that we've had on the show is a friend of the show, Jordan Oliver. Once you get your feet wet in MLW, I'd like to do like a round table with yourself, Akira Kwan, and fucking Jordan Have some road stories on here. Have some road stories once you guys get I mean, this going yeah. rolling. Because uh, we had like Pinky and we had Pinky and Homicide come on and talk about road stories. Oh, God, that was fucking It was fucking uh, out Fuck sick. Pinky too, yo. Fuck him. He didn't bring Henny to the last show, man. Fuck him. <laughs> Hell yeah. Jordan, Jordan's cool, man. Uh, I've only been around him a few times. Every time I've been around him, he's good people. Plus, like, he's over there with Myron, and Myron's my dude since, like, damn near day one. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, That's like, he's Myron another, another one. Back in the IWA Mid-South days, me, Myron, man, all of us were all back there making no money doing what we got to do in front of 12 people to own our craft. You know what I mean? And that's the grind, and that's why that's why that's what I'm saying. Like uh, a talent like that, just hearing those names alone, I I know that regardless of what ha- has has been going on, the independent wrestling scene is it will be okay, uh, as long as you guys are taking the helm. So j- just want to know how much you guys are appreciated. Thank you, man. Thank you. All right, guys. Uh, that was, this is our guy Calvin Tankman. You'll see him at VXS August 16th, and uh, catch him on his on his social media and such. And once again, thanks again for your time, sir. No problem. Yeah, have a good night. You, you too, too, sir. Be safe, sir. Yep. Peace. Turnbuckle tabloid. Three, two, one. Turnbuckle Tabloid.